Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, for part one of our series on food security, we'll be talking to Dr. Gary Przinski about COVID-19, agriculture, and food supply chains. How has COVID-19 affected agriculture and agricultural research? What gaps has the pandemic exposed? And what steps can we take to fill them? Answers to all these and more coming right up. But first, we wanted to say thank you to our very first sponsor, Gazmat Technologies, the maker of the GT5000 Terra, the smallest portable FTIR multi-gas analyzer for greenhouse gas and environmental research. Measure carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, ammonia, and water vapor in real time, simultaneously, from static or automated chambers. Visit www.gazmet.com, that's gazmet spelled G-A-S-M-E-T, or email sales at gazmet.com for more information. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show today. Today, we've got Gary Przinski with us. Gary obtained his bachelor's and master's degrees in crop and soil science from Michigan State University and his PhD in soil chemistry from The Ohio State University. He spent 29 years at Kansas State University in various faculty and administrative roles and was a university distinguished professor and head of the Department of Agronomy when he accepted his current role two years ago as Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Education in the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences at The Ohio State University. His research and teaching interests were in the areas of nutrient management and remediation of contaminated soils. Hi, Gary. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Excellent. Well, we're happy to have you. Today, uh, we are going to be talking about COVID-19 and its impacts on agriculture, agricultural research, uh, food supply chains. So uh, just to to get us started, can you tell us how agricultural research uh, has been affected or how we can anticipate that it will be impacted from COVID-19 moving forward? Yes, well, it, it certainly has been affected and, and will be for, for some time. Uh, the one obvious influence is that a lot of the active research has been or was put on, on pause uh, simply because uh, most of that is done at universities or uh, USDA Ag Research Service, and those operations were pretty much uh, shut down. Uh, so a lot of uh, data just uh, wasn't collected. Uh, some experiments were paused, others were, were lost or abandoned altogether. Fortunately, however, um, we were able to, for most states, able to get things up and running, at least in terms of the field season, uh, with the COVID timing happening and, you know, peaking out or starting uh, in earnest in March, why uh, by the time April, May came along, we were able to get a few things going out in the field. So we didn't lose everything in terms of our our annual seasonal work. So there's that pause. And right now we're dealing with new graduate students who who would like to start or postdocs who would like to start in, in the fall. And whether we can get them here, whether we'll be open for business, uh, and and a lot is in flux right now, so we don't have all the answers to that. But we may see a a decrease in the number of new students starting in in the fall, which again will translate into a a delay in in research. In long term, I think, uh, you know, it's this whole situation is going to raise a lot of interesting questions that will be subject to future research for us. So, uh, there's there's been significant impacts on the research enterprise. Yeah, sure. Um, and then also, I mean, obviously you work a lot with agriculture in general. What? How do you think agriculture at large, outside of just the research, has been impacted? Yeah. Well, the uh, the COVID crisis certainly has exposed some of our, our weak points in terms of the supply chain, uh, things of, of that nature, things that have influenced prices and, and what you can find in, in the grocery store, uh, for example. Uh, another uh, impact has been uh, more from the research side. It has definitely 
increased our comfort level with doing things remotely, whether it's it's meetings or or things like uh, diagnosing plant diseases or interpreting soil and water um, analysis information, things like that, uh, remote sensing in, in general. And I think when the crisis is done, we'll, we'll probably be more reliant on those techniques than, than we were before. Uh, one simple example would be, uh, you know, the traditional field days, which are very common in agronomy crops and soils. Uh, some states have, have been doing those virtually and actually have attracted more people to their virtual events than they would get to the in-person event. So there's an untapped audience there that uh, will probably want to continue using virtual methods to, to expand our, our reach. So there will be many effects uh, for, for many years as a result of this. Yeah, absolutely. I know uh, the societies have have transferred to a virtual meeting uh, j- just recently, actually, and uh, we found that it's it, it does present some unique opportunities to kind of connect with people you might not normally uh, connect with. So that's, I guess, at least one one upside uh, to things. Yeah. So just for for listeners who are not aware, uh, or also myself, can you explain what a field day is? Sure. Um, Most of the land-grant universities have uh, experiment fields or stations of of various types and sorts. Um, So the large tracts of land where we do uh, plot research and and run our breeding programs, things of that nature. And and typically, at least once a year, if not more, you invite the public in and you give them tours of the research and talk about uh, topics, a combination of of things that... uh, uh, the general public and, and farmers need to know right now, uh, things they might need to know in in uh, five years or so, and then things are sort of way out there, sort of cutting edge kind of thing that, that might change agriculture, you know, five or plus years uh, uh, down the road. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to showcase what we're doing as well as providing valuable information to, to the general public. Wow, that's uh, super neat. <laughs> I, I would definitely go to one of those or virtually attend, I suppose. They're a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll include maybe some links to, to more information on those in the show notes. Um, and then one more supplemental question, uh, because this is really interesting, and I just recently learned about this and was just amazed. Can you explain what a land-grant university is? Certainly. Well, there's various types of of land grants. The the three most common would be typically called the 1862 land grants, which were the original ones created uh, under the um, uh, Land Grant Act of 1862. And then there's the 1890 schools, which were created at historically black serving uh, institutions in the 1890s. And then the 1994 schools which were the, the serving the um, indigenous populations uh, of the United States. So in each case, what, what makes a land grant a land grant is that we receive uh, funds from the federal government uh, for research and extension to, uh, that are called capacity funds that allow us to maintain active research and extension programs uh, serving the general public. Uh, so that's what distinguishes a land grant from, from other public universities, for example. And in most cases, the state have to require or have to provide a match uh, to the federal federal grant uh, or the federal it is a grant from the federal government so the state will actually contribute uh, to the ag research and extension as well so the combination of those two is is what uh, really makes a land grant uh, impactful across the state gosh i just i'm so fascinated by these i was so excited when i learned about these so thank you for uh explaining that i don't want to stray too far off topic though um so kind of moving back before you, you had mentioned, um, you know, having that disruption within the food supply chains, obviously people saw things missing from the shelves or shortages. Um, we also heard a lot about crops or um, animal products that were just going to waste. Um, and I think there's a lot of just confusion there of, of why that happens or, you know, it's, it's more complex than people might realize. So can we just talk a little bit about kind of what does this food web look like? Um, Obviously, that would be different depending where you live. So we'll focus in on America here. Uh, But what does it look like? And and how have you seen this affected by COVID-19? Sure. Well, I like to sort of paint a broad picture first. And the food chain 
can kind of be divided into several segments. Uh, one I call the natural resource base that provides the ingredients, if you will, to, to grow uh, food. So that would be soil, uh, water, sun, air, nutrients. Uh, and from that, we get to production of the, the raw products, which would be grain and fruits and vegetables, uh, feed, milk, uh, the animals themselves. Um, and then we have uh, harvesting and, and processing which would be things like uh, milling of grain, uh, washing of, of vegetables before sale, packaging, baking, you know, dairy production, yogurt production, cheese production. And then finally, just, you know, your purchase and, and consumption uh, by the consumer. Labor and transportation are integral components of, of, of across that entire uh, food chain. The short term effect of this pandemic have, have mostly been related to, to labor shortages. Uh, certain components of that chain are very labor intensive, uh, a lot related to harvesting of uh, vegetables, fruits, for example, and as well as processing of, of animals. Uh, and, and with a labor shortage, then sometimes we weren't able to get to some of the things that we needed that were, were processed or harvested. And as a result, we did see some products that were wasted, dumped, if you will, because the, in the case of fruits, so they're, they're not harvested at the right time and, and they don't keep well uh, on the tree or on the bush and, and they simply rot and, and go to waste. And in some extreme cases, we've seen um, depopulation of uh, animal farms as well as or, or livestock operations, you know, as well as milk being dumped on the ground because there is no way to, to process that into, into final products ready, ready for sale. And the grocery stores even actually struggle to maintain a workforce to serve the public and, and, and getting food uh, transported from their suppliers to the, to the grocery stores themselves. So if anything, it's been amazing that uh, we have been able to maintain as, as good of supplies as we have, although if, if you do the grocery shopping in your house, you probably notice some empty shelves and, and uh, less of a selection in, in many areas. Uh, usually related to the labor of, of, of getting it to, to the store. Yeah. And just, just a shout out to all of the farmers and people involved with processing and labor who have been working really hard um, to keep food on the shelves. They've been uh, doing a good job. So this kind of leads into the next section of, of this talk. And, and we wanted to talk a lot about resiliency. And I think one of the things that we've seen is that you know, there are some of those, you know, kind of bottlenecks, maybe, um, or, or places where things can be disrupted. Obviously, a lot of disruption this year. But uh, we wanted to talk about, like, what are some things that we can, either either things we're doing right, or, or things that are, that are, are good in the system already, but also how can we improve resiliency to these kinds of disruptions? So I wanted to start um, with just ag and ag research. Where are some areas where we can start building in more of that resiliency? Sure. Well, uh, just to, to follow up on, on the labor requirements, um, a couple of things will, will come from that. One would be that we'll just build some redundancy or something into the system or alternate labor sources uh, in times of, of need if your workforce is is sick uh, or in the case of some sort of a processing facility that needed to be uh, sanitized, you know, faster methods to do that to get things back uh, up and running. Longer term, I think you'll see uh, more move towards mechanization. You know, a lot of the uh, fruits and vegetables are hand harvested, and, and going to mechanization is a way to to kind of get around those uh, those labor requirements. Um, and on on the research side, uh, it, it's been interesting to sort of step back and and ask ourselves uh, what. You know, of what we do, which is covers uh, both short and long term uh, goals, you know, what what is really important for this food supply today? And then how do we ensure that we can maintain that activity uh, in in times of, of crisis? So one example that I use is, you know, plant breeding, which clearly is a long term process. It takes many years uh, um, from the time a cross is made until a variety or hybrid is released to, to the public. 
But in between, you know, there are certain uh, germplasm and, and other genetic resources that need to be maintained uh, all the time in times of crisis in particular. And if we lose that, then it's, it's a major setback in terms of, of uh, uh, delays in, in the breeding process. Um, so we need to identify those critical personnel as well as the critical tasks and uh, should we be in a situation like this uh, again, make sure that we know what, what is it truly essential and, and what we should focus on in the short run and then slowly build back uh, to the activities that have more of a, a long-term focus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and then I wanted to talk about uh, the, the food supply chain uh, again. So what, what can we do to build resiliency in for that? Well, again, it would be, um, you know, looking at where our labor comes from um, and either finding alternate sources of labor or finding uh, alternate ways to process or, or harvest uh, materials to get them to, to market, uh, to perhaps come up with some plans in terms of, you know, which um, ag products you would emphasize to ensure supply, which maybe have lower labor requirements, just to ensure that there's a steady supply of of food overall. I do think that this is going to be the topic for uh, research in areas like rural sociology and, and labor and, and trade uh, for many years to come as we sort of dissect uh, how we reacted to the situation and, and how we could be better prepared uh, for, for the future. Yeah, I, and something I wanted to ask you about here, um, I've seen some people that were like, well, if if the problem is that we've got, you know, all, all of our meat is processed in one location or, you know, a few larger locations, you know, maybe it's better to have, you know, more more plants that are more spread out or more like local connections, kind of more farm to table style things. Is that what are your thoughts on that? Is that like practical, feasible uh, yes, very practical. And in fact, that is part of the resilience. Um, what we have seen in Ohio is that we have small meat processing facilities scattered around the state. And as the, the big companies were struggling to keep a labor force in, in place to continue processing animals, uh, many of, of our local producers went to those smaller processing plants. So uh, they were immediately booked uh, and, and at capacity. So perhaps we'll see more of those develop or, or more of those open up uh, to help uh, for for um, future times, uh, if, if you also think about local food supply and the benefits of, of that, it, it does promote local food because your your uh, local farmers are sending it to a local processor and, and sending their animals to a local processor and then even marketing on a on a smaller scale. Um, so there there have actually been benefits in in that regard, but that does add to our resilience, which is which is a positive thing. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a yes and situation, you know. Correct. So, so that's great. Um, yeah, we've living in Wisconsin. We obviously have a lot of, of farmers in this area, and it's been cool to see see a lot of local people really rise to the challenge and you know find different places to to sell their products when they lost restaurant business or you know things like that has been really cool and innovative. So, so that's a, a good thing. <laughs> science friends, I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Gary's article, Research and Funding in the Time of COVID-19, published in CSA News, will be freely available for the next two weeks. You can find a link to it in our show notes. If you are a certified crop advisor or a certified professional soil scientist, you can also take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thanks again also to our sponsor, Gazmat Technologies. Conduct greenhouse gas flux measurements in the field using the GT5000 Terra. Weighing 20.7 pounds, splash-proof IP54 rated, internal pump, and vibration resistant, the GT5000 Terra is a robust and portable multi-gas analyzer for field work. Visit www.gazmat.com or email sales at gazmat.com for more information. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. 
wanted to ask about uh, you had mentioned talking about how we'll we'll be looking at you know trade impacts and economic impacts. Um, so can you talk about that a little bit? Obviously, we've seen uh, a economic hit and disruption here as well. Um, can you talk about how that relates to ag, ag research, uh, anything like that? Yes, uh, I would divide that into two general categories. One would be sort of on the public side, the state and, and federal government. And of course, they're going to see reductions in tax revenues uh, from all sources, and we'll have to tighten their budgets. That has a potential impact on, on agriculture. So we think about um, cost share agreements uh, for things like soil con controlling soil erosion, conservation, soil conservation, uh, improvements in water quality through adoption of best management practices. It's possible we might have you know, less funds available for those sorts of programs and, and uh, lose some of the gains that we have made over the past uh, couple of decades. Uh, on the potential positive side, uh, previous recessions and stimulus packages that have been passed by the federal government have actually uh, provided increases for research uh, funding. So uh, we haven't seen that yet, but it, it still is, is is a possibility and certainly something that uh, we're watching uh, to Washington, D.C. To, to see what's going on. The second category is the private sector. And clearly, the egg economy is is suffering right now. It was even before COVID in terms of low commodity prices uh, overall, and um, you'll see less investment um, in private in research by private companies, at least for a short time. Uh, so that will slow down some of the innovation that, that was uh, taking over agriculture. Uh, although to loop back some of my earlier comments about mechanization, um, I do think that uh, eventually we'll get on track and uh, we are going to see increases in our use of uh, mechanization, automation, artificial intelligence, other higher technology tools in, in agriculture as we try to produce more with, uh, with less land and, and perhaps a, a smaller labor force. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um... Can you explain what the what a cost sharing agreement is for those who aren't familiar with that? Well, if a, if, if a farmer is asked to implement new practices that would control soil erosion or perhaps have an improvement in, in water quality, uh, those changes generally in the short run do not increase their yield. So there's no way to sort of cost that out in terms of the farmer is going to realize a you know a, a, an increase in income if they adopt the practices. It's it's revenue neutral. Uh, so in order to encourage farmers to adopt those practices, you'll see cost share uh, payments where <clears throat> the federal government will pay a portion of that, uh, and sometimes all of, but usually a portion. So it's called cost share because the farmer pays part, and then the um, government pays the balance in order to encourage those practices to to be put in, in into use. Soil erosion is, is a good example. I mean, to control soil erosion on a single year basis, there's no return on that investment. It's very long term. So to help the farmers get to that long term uh, advantage, uh, they, they need a little financial help. Okay. Yeah, kind of kind of like uh, you were talking earlier, where you have to find the essentials, but then also look ahead to, to the long term. Um Speaking of, uh, I wanted to ask about kind of future research uh, areas that are, are related to this, whether that's just the resiliency or uh, anything like that. Can you talk about what can we do moving forward for things like this? I do think there will be a lot of effort uh, on the resiliency of, of the food system, and that spans the entire spectrum. So the food supply chain that I, I described earlier, but, but also a lot of the political and the financial and the trade implications on on that system, you know, to find the right balance if we get into a crisis like this uh, again, that we can maintain the food supply, uh, maintain the, the workforce that it takes uh, to, to provide for that. 
And then a lot of other sort of neat ideas that will come out of this. I mentioned mechanization, use of our artificial intelligence to, to figure things out, use of remote sensing uh, to uh, gather a lot of data and use that to make uh, crop management decisions in, in season, which is you know, something we've been slowly working towards uh, uh, over time. But I, I think this might accelerate it a, a little bit. Yeah, seems like there's uh, a lot of good stuff on the horizon there. Uh, so that's wonderful. Uh, I've got three questions left for you. Thank you so much for, for your input on all those other ones. Uh, the first one would be, uh, where can people go to learn more about these issues? And I'll, I'll start us off. You and uh, Scott Engel from USDA did a article about COVID-19 impacts earlier this year. Um, that talks a little bit more about, um, focuses a little bit more on what researchers can do uh, right now if they've faced disruption or, or research that's been delayed, um, as well as some of the things we talked about today. So that was published in CSA News. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. Um, it'll be free for the next two weeks. Uh, so I wanted to put that one out there, first of all. Thank you for doing that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But what, where else can people go to, to learn about these issues? Well, a lot of it, uh, a lot of this is so new that uh, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, sort of traditional textbook kind of information out there. So, I mean, if you're a, a farmer and you're impacted by, by COVID, uh, your usual sources of information, such as the Farm Service Agency or USDA ARS uh, or your land grant university is a good place uh, you know, to look for information that, that's fairly up to date. Uh, you have to rely on, on your trusted news sources uh, to get good information, good objective information. Beyond that, I mean, the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society, and Soil Science Society of America are putting out uh, good, good information. Uh, you've referenced some of that already. And then there's also organizations like the Association for Public and Land Grant Universities that is uh, putting out a lot of information about the impact of COVID specific to, to research uh, to, and, and to higher education a, as a whole. And I can't help to put, put in a plug for the uh, American Society of Agronomy Sustainable and Secure Food blog, which is uh, a good uh, source of kind of contemporary topics uh, about agriculture in general from everything from, you know, your home garden to to the vast uh, fields of, of grain uh, across the Midwest. Yeah, it's a it's a great resource. We will include links to that as well as all the other resources that you just mentioned in the show notes. Uh, if people want to learn more there. Uh, second question for you. If people want to to get involved, I mean, obviously, it's it's a weird time <laughs> to be alive, a uh, very strange time, but I think people want, you know, they want to help and they want to know what they can do. Uh, what would you suggest, whether that's to uh, for the general public to build resiliency, f farmers, small business owners, all, all the way up to the, the top of institutions and government? Like what what can we do to be helping? Well, there are a lot of things. Um, it, it's a you know, kind of renewed political activism right now, and, and that's a good thing. So writing a letter or an email or uh, talking to your representatives at uh, the state and federal government levels is, is a good thing. Expressing your support for, uh, put in a plug for research, you know, that ag research is, is very important. Uh, and we see that now that uh, we, it, it is really needed in times of crisis as well as everything in between. Uh, also put in a plug for, you know, your local food relief efforts, uh, which take uh, many forms, but we've seen in the media pictures of long lines of people looking for, for um, uh, food relief uh, you know, donations. So either monetary donations or donations of food to your local food bank, I think, are, are very useful in, in the immediate uh, uh, term. Another uh, uh, option is to support your local uh, farmers market, your local food markets uh, that are that are selling local food. It provides a, an outlet for those producers for uh, whatever it is that they're selling, and, and of course gives you high quality produce that uh, you can use. And, and particularly if it's something you can't find in in the grocery store uh, that uh, you can find at the farmers market, why well, there you have it. 
And then finally, uh, you know, I, I think about frontline workers and certainly the healthcare workers are, are critical, uh, but that person that checks you out at your grocery store is also a frontline worker. Just say thank you. Yes, yes, totally, totally. Uh, yeah, I actually was able to go to my first farmer's market this year and it was very, it was very nice. People socially distanced. They were careful about handle, who handled what food and stuff like that. So uh, I encourage if you can safely get out there to, to do so. Um, and then final question for you is what is one fun fact that people would not know about you uh, if they just had this podcast or, or your research? Uh, what, what would that be? Well, I, as an undergraduate um, in, in trying to earn my keep for my uh, pay for my undergraduate degree, I I worked uh, several summers in Western Alaska for the Alaska Gold Company. I was just a, a laborer, but uh, observed their mining methods and, and the remnants of, of that on, on the landscape. And I, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, in my uh, research career at Kansas State University, I got quite heavily involved in remediation of of mine lands from the mining of lead and, and zinc. Um, and I often reflected back on, uh, gosh, if I, you know, if I had known in Alaska that I was going to be doing that, I probably would have paid more attention to what was going on. But I, I did learn, go back and, and uh, learn some lessons from that that was actually used uh, in some of my reclamation research at, at Kansas State University. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> did you ever like see gold? Like were you mining or what what were you working on while you were there? Well, there was a, a, a permafrost area. They actually had to thaw the ground before they dredged it. So you're in this we called it the thaw field. You're pump, pumping water into the ground, the cold water to try and, and get it to thaw out. Um you didn't get to see much of the gold that was uh, coming out of the dredge, but you could go down to the local beach. This was on the, the Norton so Sound in the Bering Sea, and you could pan for gold. So you could definitely see what they were after by just going out and digging down in the sand to a, to a hard pan and then panning that out, and you would definitely get gold flecks. So I knew what they were after. Oh, my gosh. That is wild. <laughs> That's so crazy. Uh <laughs> Well, I guess that would make going to a beach in Alaska m more fun than one would maybe imagine. Yes, well, it was a little too cold to go swimming, but <laughs> you could pan the gold. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Uh, good. Good luck to you as you are beginning a, a new school year in a in a wild time. Uh, and yeah, just thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Excellent. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. You'll find a link to today's paper and other resources for this episode in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe and don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Stitcher, or anywhere else you find your podcast if you like our show. We are also available on Lyceum, the world's first audio learning community, where you can join our discussion group and comment on each episode. This podcast is a joint production of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by authors are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers.